and welcome to Media 7 in front of a live audience at Auckland's Classic Comedy Club. Later in the show, we'll look back on the 20 years this month since New Zealand was connected to the internet. But first, with the arrival of flight NZ1 from Los Angeles on Saturday, New Zealand officially became part of the global swine flu story. And while no one wants to be committing pandemic panic, there is no doubt that this is real and it's potentially very serious. So, how are we doing? Here's a news mash. Uh, airports are on high alert for that swine flu outbreak, which is quick, quickly spreading this morning from Mexico to the rest of the world. We are learning that 10 students in New Zealand may be infected. They Go on, admit it. You felt a perverse sense of pride that New Zealand was right up there in the headlines, even if it was that we're in bronze medal position on the potential swine flu pandemic. The news for us broke thus. Confirmation tonight that the deadly swine flu that has killed 80 people in Mexico and left 1,300 ill is in New Zealand. And from there we crossed to a casually dressed Minister of Health delivering his first of many composed and orderly interviews. Well, the government's taking this very seriously, as New Zealanders would expect us to do. By the following evening, it seemed that the virus had already taken Wendy Petrie from us. But no, she was out there on the front line doing a pointless live cross. Here's health correspondent Laurelie Mason. Laurelie. Meanwhile, Laurelie Mason found out what she got into journalism for in the first place. Her very own swine flu Twitter feed. And later in the evening, Nightline's crew got so excited that they started killing people. 20 cases have been confirmed in the US with six deaths. No, we don't know where they got those numbers from either. But the local media response was a model of measure compared to, say, that of Michael Savage, who runs America's third biggest talk radio show. Why are they not looking into this as a possible uh, terrorist attack on America? Of course, no responsible news organisation would be talking that way. Oh, Fox News went there, but their in-house doctor was pretty sharp. The best way to contain an emerging flu is to instruct people about washing their hands properly, not coughing and sneezing on each other, and to isolate cases. Perhaps they could have doctors front the whole channel. In general, the local media seem to have taken seriously the word at Monday's press conference that they are a crucial means of communicating public health information. But what's the balance between hand-washing advice and holding to account? Did we get it right? And will we keep on doing so once the shine goes off the swine? Joining us now to discuss the story are two people who've been reporting it in different ways. Dr Jim McVeigh, better known to local internet users as the man at macdoctor.co.nz, who's been following the story since it broke. And the editor of New Zealand Doctor magazine, Barbara Fountain. And our panel is completed with Lillian Ng, who's been a contributor to 3 News and is a medical doctor at Middlemore Hospital. Welcome to you all. Now, Jim, the New Zealand Herald ran an editorial this week um, somewhat indignant about being accused of, of fear-mongering by its readers and, and who believed this was all hype. And it made the case that the reporting had actually been quite measured and responsible. Is that what, what you've made of it so far? Well, in general, the, the reporting has been quite measured, uh, mostly sticking to the facts. Occasionally, they've had the sensationalist headlines. I mean, the, the killer flu virus sort of thing and the deadly flu virus. Um, which just sort of overemphasizes the fact that in, in New Zealand we've had no deaths, we've had no deaths anywhere except in Mexico, so that technically this is not a deadly flu virus at the moment. The other thing I've noticed about the reporting is that the journalists appear to have very much taken on board the message that they are the prime channel for public health information. Mm -hmm. I've lost count of the number of times I've been told to wash my hands. <laughs> Do you think there is a point where the reporting needs to turn over into holding account? Because you've been quite critical of some of the official response, haven't you? Oh, yes. Uh, um, uh, unlike um, our Minister of Health, I do believe that we're not quite being as uh, sharp and responsive as we should have been. Um, so I believe that, that that should come out. However, probably not quite the right time at the moment when we're still dealing with the, with the actual initial stages of the flu. But certainly when we look at it later down the line, I'd expect that to happen in the media. Now, Barbara, you're reporting to quite a different audience. You're reporting to doctors themselves. What have you been telling them? Well, I think the key thing for us has actually to distill um, the key points from the information that's been coming through from the Ministry of Health to update them on the um, figures which have as you mentioned earlier, being um, a little fury, eerie. <laughs> and um, 
also to kind of provide the answers that they're going to be facing when their patients come in to see them and to try and help alleviate some of the panic that may arise. Now, you publish all ministry advisories on your site, don't you? What have, what have you made of the communications? Have, 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 have they had the right tone? Um, from a um, reporting point of view, we've had some difficulty. Each day they've had a media briefing in Wellington, which journalists from around the country have phoned into if you weren't present in Wellington. Those lines have popped in and out. There's been difficulty. It hasn't been very effective. And as a reporter who was working with that um, said, if this was a real pandemic, there's no way that would have been an effective way to get the news out to um, the other news organisations around the country. The other so that's quite a good lesson, isn't it? If there's going to be a crisis, get your telecommunications the IT, right. Yeah. Exactly. The other issue we've had a little bit is that because um, the um, cases have kind of been watched in various DHBs around the country, a few DHBs are routinely sending out press releases, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of central coordination around that, and that's part of the problem we have with our fragmented um, health system. Lillian, what have you made of the tone of the reporting? What the phrases like uh, yellow alert, are, are they helpful or are they just purely functional? Well, I think words are very important when you're conveying messages to the public because it's all about communicating it in a way that's really uh, accessible to people. They're going to take those messages and they're going to try and an analyse it and um, act accordingly. And so it's very important, I think, that the content is accurate um, and that it's credible and that people are aware of the consequences because uh, it is a public health issue and it does need to be treated with respect but you don't want to panic the public and so I think there's a very fine balance between using words such as deadly, global health scare, code yellow without any context and that can be very difficult to do in a soundbite and so I think the pitfalls of healthcare journalism are such that you need to have a very clear message and you need to be mindful of the way in which you deliver it. Now, you're, you're actually the only medical doctor I can think of who has also recorded, reported health issues uh, for a media organisation. Is there anyone else that does that? I'm not aware of that, but, you know, I think uh, it, it is a two-edged sword because, uh, there, you know, like I said, there's a balance. You've got to try and get it right to the public so that they can understand what's going on, but at the same time you want to um, provide it in a context where it's actually making sense and where it's actually accurate. And sometimes that can be quite difficult to do because um, I think with this particular virus, um, it is influenza A, but it's a subtype. And uh, what is very important is that people know that um, just because they've got flu-like symptoms, it doesn't necessarily mean they've got swine flu. Um, and not all that is flu is swine flu. Because um, you don't want to have a whole mass of people trundling down to their GP saying, I'm sick, have I got swine flu? And of course, you know, this is something that we are um, subtyping. We're actually make, doing blood tests to actually type what it is. Whereas then if you have normal flu, your GP will say, well, you know, you have got flu-like symptoms, go home, it will resolve. Um, so I think it's very important that uh, people are aware of, you know, what specific things are, 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 are sort of particular to swine flu. Hmm. Uh, Jim, do you think <coughs> what, what Lillian mentioned, the, the danger of you know, doctor panic basically, <laughs> rushing off to your doctor when you don't need to, is, is, is that an issue? Because I, I was rather surprised to see the Don Post run a story on a passenger who'd been on, on the flight who off his own bat had charged off to his doctor and gotten Tammy flu and was mm. desperately angry that no one had given them some. I, I get the feeling that's not what we want people to do. Well, what's basically happening at the moment is that people are sort of rushing off to the doctor with flu-like symptoms, and there's just no way on God's good earth that they have swine flu. Uh, it's just that they haven't been in any contact. They just have made basically straight ordinary flu. In fact, most of them just have a cold. Um, so it, it's starting to clog up the system. And the biggest danger with this kind of thing is that, you know, forget the pandemic, it's the, it's the sort of... Uh, uh, the, almost the epidemic of people presenting to emergency departments, A&Ms, with the flu, clogging up the system when they don't actually need to. So the next message must be then, don't go to your doctor. Yeah, well, exactly that. Um, unless you have um, some sort of fairly major symptom like shortness of breath, chest pain or vomiting, you shouldn't really be going to your doctor at the present moment with your flu. Um, it, it will be even worse if... if swine flu actually eventuates because then we actually do want to keep people at home in order to stop the spread. Hmm. Barbara, 
as discussed, there, are, there aren't many doctors who are also journalists, but we do have some very experienced senior health reporters, um, uh, Karen Brown at Radio New Zealand being one. Mm. Uh, how much of an advantage is, is it to have that, that kind of institutional knowledge and that experience? I think it's a tremendous advantage, and I think we see it with Karen and also with Martin Johnson at The Herald. I mean, he's been there for a, a long time. And um, you also, I also get the sense that you get that um, seniority in it and you have a bit more weight in the newsroom that um, maybe they help counter what might some of those headlines that might appear. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Do, mm. do they actually say there is just, no, you can't say that? Well, um, I would like to think so, although it's interesting to know what's actually happening in our mainstream newsrooms now with um, subbing going out to the suburbs and um, the, um, also, like you say, we've only got a small handful of senior journalists, but a lot more juniors. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I would like to think they could, and looking at the Herald's coverage, I suspect Martin does have a hand in, in keeping it um, seemly. <laughs> of course, Lillian, the thing that we have seen on TV, and you, you've done TV, you'll know why this is done, is, is the, the inevitable shots of shots in the window of people under quarantine, uh, very much you know, human interest type stories, kids through the window. Is, is it inevitable that TV has to cover it that way? Yeah, I think images are very powerful and I think the point of difference with television is, is the use of those images and the way people perceive it. And I think, you know, when you see people en masse with masks and they're going to work, it does go into our consciousness and it does have that perception of, you know, a climate of fear that, that is sort of going around. And I think it's very important that you take that in context. You know, Mexico City is a city of 20 million people. Um, you know, how virulent, how, how damaging is this virus? Um, and I think you, know, you really need to sort of see where you get those sound bites from. But I think the images are definitely powerful and it's the perception of what people see that they will kind of act on. And, and if you like, their own sort of psychological kind of impact will be uh, dependent on how they perceive it. Because oddly enough, the people that we see through the windows all seem to be quite happy. <laughs> um, we'll take a break now. When we come back, we'll recall one of the darkest years in New Zealand's history.